Why the Cross by Father Edward Lane, Part 2, The Tree of Life, Chapter 8, Second Reading. Strangely enough, he could have been, and in fact was, declared innocent by his earthly judge. Pilate, after having weighed the evidence, said to the chief priest and to the multitudes, I find no cause in this man. Not once only in the course of the trial was this assertion made by the judge, for we are told by the evangelist that Pilate said to the enemies of Jesus the third time, Why? What hath this man done? I find no cause of death in him. I will let him go. The Redeemer heard these words but did not acquiesce in them. He knew that his sentence should not be one of acquittal. He knew that before God the whole human race stood condemned and that he, as its head, was involved in that condemnation. His heart, he murmured in the words of the psalmist, Longe a salute mea verba de lectorum maiorum. That is, in spite of my heart-rending cries, deliverance is far from me. Jesus recognized that, false and unjust as were the statements of the perjured witnesses, they fell utterly short of expressing the guilt that pressed upon him. He was silent because he knew that, being made sin for our sakes, he incurred the sentence of condemnation pronounced upon him by the invisible tribunal of God. Of that sentence, the Jews were all unwittingly only the executors. Men imputed to him crimes he had not committed, but God put on him the iniquities of us all. Laden with this guilt, he was to die a death that should proceed to moral annihilation. He was to become a worm and no man, the reproach of men and the outcast of the people. Creatures violently wrested from their end through man's perverse use of them avenged their wrongs on the new head of the sinful mankind. The chastisement of our peace was forthwith laid upon him. He was wounded for our iniquities. He was bruised for our sins. In his sin, man had torn creatures from their allegiance to their maker. Made to serve God's glory, they had been forced to serve man's lusts. Man had imposed on them a slavery under which they chafed. For the creature, says St. Paul, was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him that made it subject. The hour of their vengeance has sounded. In the book of wisdom it is written, and he will sharpen his severe wrath for a spear, and the whole world shall fight with him against the unwise. Shafts of lightning shall go directly from the clouds, thick hail shall be cast upon them, the water of the sea shall rage against them, and the river shall run together in a terrible manner. So in the passion, creatures turned on the race that had wronged them, avenging themselves on the race through its head. The rough stones over which the new Adam was dragged bruised and tore his delicate limbs. The icy water chilled him to the bone. The leathern thongs reduced his flesh to shreds and bespattered the praetorium with his blood. The cords that bound him hampered his movements. He could not cleanse the spittle from brow and eyes. To hunger, cold, thirst, exhaustion, fear, dejection, dismay, physical and mental anguish, to creatures of all kinds he was surrendered a helpless prey. He does not resist them, nor does he protest. A traitor betrays him with a kiss. He does not withhold his lips. He is seized and bound. 
He offers his hands to the manacles unresistingly. A servile courtier strikes him in the face. He does not evade the blow. All had been foretold by Isaiah. I have given my body to the strikers and my cheeks to them that pluck them. I have not turned away my face from them that rebuked me and spit upon me. The iron of the nails forces its way with agonizing pain through the torn fibers and muscles of hands and feet. The wood of the grooves makes an uneasy couch for the mangled body, yet he submits to all without a murmur. He shall be led as a sheep to the slaughter, and shall be dumb as a lamb before the shearer, and he shall not open his mouth. The Savior does not resist, because he reads in the fury of creatures against him the divine decree of his heavenly Father. So creatures work their will on him until, from the sole of his foot, even unto the head, there is no soundness in him, but wounds and bruises and festering sores, which are neither closed nor bound up nor nullified with oil. In the mock crowning and the derisive purple and the feudal scepter, is punished man's proud usurpation of God's sovereignty. There is a close link between the drama of the passion and the scene of the first transgression. In the passion, the fall is being undone, and the great revolt, with all its evil consequences, is being duly expiated. The earth was cursed in men's transgressions, and instead of pleasant fruits, it yielded for him but thorns. And God said to Adam, Cursed is the earth in thy work. With labor and toil shalt thou eat thereof, and thorns and thistles shall it bring forth. Now of these thorns is fashioned a diadem, but a diadem of mockery and torture. The marsh has furnished the strong cane reed to serve as a derisive scepter. This symbol of royalty is used by the soldiers to beat the crown down on the Savior's head until the thorn points are blunted against the bone. In his pride, Man had aimed at usurping the sovereignty of God. He aspired to rule creatures independently of his creator. It was no accident that the cruelty of the soldiers took the form it actually assumed. A law of retribution runs through all the sufferings of the passion. Man, in sinning, had won for himself a sorry kind of kingship. God had spoken of it mockingly. Behold, Adam is become as one of us, knowing good and evil. Man's usurpation had issued for him in the very mockery of sovereignty. He became the slave of the creatures he thought to rule. For whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sins. The reed and the circlet of thorns were apt symbols of men's royalty. They expressed with bitter irony the absurdity of his pretensions. And as Jesus beheld the wretched pageant of mock worshippers defile before him, and listened to their derisive salutations. As he heard the taunts and jeers, as he endured the blows and suffered the blindfolding, he felt in his inmost soul the justice of it all. He saw in it the appropriate punishment of man's unholy attempt to seat himself on the throne of the Most High. 
Annas, Caiaphas, Pilate, and even Judas are but the unconscious, though culpable, executors of God's chastisement of sin. It was not merely the sordid greed of the traitor or the avarice of the Sanhedrin that causes the price of the betrayal of Jesus to be assessed at thirty pieces of silver. It was the money value of a slave. And they took the thirty pieces of silver, the price of him that was prized of the children of Israel. Man in his fall forfeited the liberty that belonged to the child of God and became the slave of sin and Satan. All sin has its root in pride. Sufferings, therefore, which should be a direct expiation of pride, might be expected to be an outstanding element in the passion. And so it fell out. Ignominy, degradation, and shame mark every stage of the passage from Gethsemane to Golgotha. Christ was made to drink to the dregs the cup of humiliations. Taunts and jeers, mockery and derision accompany him at every step. He was, according to the terrible metaphor of Jeremiah, surfeited with humiliations. His enemies were not satisfied with exhausting on him all the inventions of their fiendish cruelty. They made him the butt of ridicule. Their mocking laughter added a peculiar bitterness to the physical pain he had to endure. Men before and since his time have been condemned by unjust sentences, and yet the carrying out of these sentences is, in all normal times, invested with the majestic forms of the law. A certain dignity is flung around the last moments of even the worst criminals. But apart from the superhuman patience with which Jesus endured his sufferings, the passion to the outward eye was lacking in every element of dignity and solemnity. As blinded with blood and exhausted with pain, the Son of Man stumbled through the rough and dusty streets toward the gate of Ephraim, there was no respectful parting of the crowds to let him pass. There were no long lines of silent, sympathetic, reverential spectators along the way of sorrows. Forcing a passage through the crowds that had come up to Jerusalem for the Passover presented some difficulty. Men jostled against and pushed one another, curious to see the discredited prophet on his way to execution. Reading the jeering legend on the title board that hung around his neck, they raised shouts of laughter. The contrast between the former high pretensions of the prophet and his present plight stirred their mirth. The sensuous and the delicate, coming on the spectacle, turned from it in loathing, but not in pity. There is no beauty in him nor comeliness, and we have seen him, and there was no sightliness that we should be desirous of him, despised in the most abject of men, a man of sorrows, and acquainted with infirmity. And his look was, as it were, hidden and despised, wherefore we esteemed him not. The indifferent merely glanced at him and hurried on their way preoccupied by their own concerns. Those whom he had healed of their ills of body and soul and who had for a time been inspired with enthusiasm in his cause were now furious at what they would consider their passing lapse of judgment. They thrust their way to his side to scream curses at him. The envious, the hostile, and the cruel found a savage satisfaction in his sufferings and rejoiced in the past to which he had come. 
and as the crowd swayed to and fro in the Savior's passage, they continually knocked against the cross, causing the bearer to stumble and to fall. The Nazarene had become the sport of a populace gathered together for a festival. The mockery, jeering, and contempt reach a climax on the summit of Calvary. The condemned criminals at his side, the priests, the soldiers, and the rabble, all take actual part in it and vie with one another in cruel and biting sarcasm. This, they cried, is the great prophet who could raise the dead to life. Let us see now whether he can save himself from dying. He saved others. Now let him save himself. One who pretended to be able to move mountains ought not to find it difficult to draw out the nails from hands and feet and step down from the cross. There was no stir, no movement, no reply from the figure on the gibbet. What had become of his vaunted power? Did he not say that he could destroy the glorious temple and rebuild it in three days? Should it not then be a comparatively easy thing to detach himself from the gibbet of infamy? He had boasted of his friendship with God. He had said that he was the Son of the Most High. Surely then, they sneered, we may look to see God himself come in person to save him. And as there appeared no rescue from heaven, they laughed loud and long, at the utter helplessness of their enemy. All the details of this torture had been described by the psalmist, saying, All they that saw me have laughed me to scorn. They have spoken with the lips and wagged the head. Let him save him, seeing that he delighteth in him. Let him now come down from the cross, shriek the priest and the scribes, and we shall believe him. Christ heard the challenge and stirred not. They concluded that his power was no match for that of the Sanhedrin. For one to boast of divine power and then in the time of testing to prove utterly helpless was a mark, so they argued, of folly. But had he been only foolish, he could have been ignored. But in fact, he had proved himself a dangerous fool. He had sought to delude and to bewitch the people with false ideals. He had shown a complete want of sympathy with their national aspirations and an indifference to their national pride. Had the nation followed him, it would have found itself in still dire slavery than that under which it had already groaned. He had insinuated that they lay captive under a heavier yoke than that of Rome, and that the messianic salvation they looked for consisted in liberation from this yoke, and not, as they judged, in shaking off the rule of Rome. He had implicitly stated that they were slaves, they, the children of Abraham. We are the seed of Abraham, they had said to him, and we have never been slaves to any man. How sayest thou, you shall be free? In all this, he had shown himself to be the enemy of his country and his people. Surely, as the high priest had said, it was expedient that one man should die for the people and that that whole nation perish not. Jesus hung powerless on the cross because it was decreed that he should die for the nation, and not only for the nation, but to gather in one the children of God that were dispersed. He saved others, himself he cannot save. What a profound truth was, unawares, contained in the words of this taunt flung in the face of the dying Christ by his enemies. He might indeed have claimed the privilege due to his personal innocence and have descended from the cross. But he who enjoyed the nature of the Godhead 
did not cling to the rights that belonged to him as such, but he emptied himself, taking the form of a servant. Making himself like unto fallen man in all things save sin, he consented to hang powerless on the cross as head of the guilty race. And accepting the fate that was his because of this headship, he humbled himself, becoming obedient unto death, even to the death of the cross. As head of sinners, he had not the right to save himself. Sin was to be destroyed in the destruction of him who did no sin. Neither was guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled did not revile, but who his own self bore our sins in his body upon the tree, that we being dead to sin should live to justice. Christ's fate was to be a victim for sin. The lot of the victim is to be destroyed, not saved. The powerlessness of Jesus to save himself was precisely the source from which sprang his power to save others. At the end of ages he hath appeared for the destruction of sin by the sacrifice of himself. He suffered once to exhaust the sins of many. In his death, sin was destroyed and the empire of Satan overthrown. A mysterious law of retribution runs right through the whole passion considered as a sacrifice of expiation. Pride is at the root of all sin. Mankind in its head had to be humbled utterly in order to expiate its wicked pride. Hence, humiliations are heaped upon Christ during the Passion. He is the butt of mockery and derision. He does not open his mouth or complain because he sees in his sufferings the appropriate satisfaction for the sins of the race to which he had united himself. That union with the race makes him powerless to save himself. Because of that union, it is decreed that he must die. But his powerlessness to save himself was the very source of his power to save all others. The life of men issues from the death of the Son of Man.